Ever since its beginnings as a 17th century colony, Quebec has been characterized by a predominantly French-speaking population that has proudly held on to its distinct language, heritage, and Catholic faith in a sea of a largely Anglophone Canada. Beginning in the 19th century, Quebec underwent a period of rapid industrialization, but its traditional agrarian society remained resilient. The influence of the Roman Catholic Church intertwined with the French-Canadian identity played a central role in shaping both social and political structures. This close association between the church and the state was often referred to as a clerico-nationalist alliance, otherwise known as Quebec nationalism. By the early 20th century, Quebec found itself grappling with economic challenges and political unrest. Industrialization had led to urbanization, with major cities like Montreal and Quebec City experiencing significant growth. However, socioeconomic disparities between rural and urban areas were increasingly apparent. World War II brought further changes to Quebec's landscape. The province experienced an economic boom fueled by war-related industries, which led to an increase in job opportunities. Yet, this economic growth only served to underscore the inequality that persisted between the French-speaking majority and the English-speaking minority, particularly in the realm of economic power. Overlooking this post-war prosperity was Quebec's premier, Maurice Duplessis, and his party, the Union Nationale. From 1936 to 1939, and then again from 1944 to 1959, Duplessis maintained his power through support from traditional elements, political corruption, and an outdated electoral system. His government held conservative views, focused on traditionalism, emphasizing the need for Quebec nationalism to uphold such views. To Quebec's liberals, Duplessis's reign was coined as the Great Darkness. One of the most defining aspects of Duplessis's rule was his close alliance with the Catholic Church. The Church played a prominent role in many aspects of Quebecois society, including education and social services. Duplessis reinforced this relationship, granting the Church significant control over education and health care. The Church's authority in Quebec would be challenged when it hired lay staff to cover the expanding needs of education, health care, and social services. The lay staff increasingly demanded a say in how these services were run, exposing the Church's degrading authority and blocking social change. The post-war economic progress under Duplessis brought about future problems. Economic prosperity gave rise to a promising middle class of skilled workers, executives, managers, and teachers in urban areas, many of whom were now homeowners instead of renters. This new middle class began to desire progressive modernization in Quebec in the face of Duplessis's and the Catholic Church's narrow-minded, conservative traditionalism. The seeds of change were sown. Maurice Duplessis died in 1959 and with it his regime. In the election of June 22, 1960, the Liberals broke the hold of the Union Nationale, taking 51 seats and 51.5% of the popular vote, as compared to the Union Nationale's 43 seats and 46.6% of the vote. Lesage's Liberals promoted a progressive and modern platform, which looked ideal in the eyes of adults who wanted nothing more to do with the Union Nationale's corrupt and isolationist policies that had ruled Quebec with an iron fist for the past 16 years. Lesage would be elected as Quebec's 19th premier. Jean Lesage and his Liberal Party looked to change every aspect of Quebec's society, ushering the province into a quiet revolution that went on to define the province throughout the 1960s. Lesage's reforms and the Quiet Revolution focused on three main areas, secularization, political reform, and the development of a modern welfare state, a drastic break from Duplessis's policies. One of Lesage's first reforms focused on health care. A new public hospital network ensured that every Quebec resident gained access to essential health care services, regardless of their economic background a significant step towards creating a healthier and more equal society. 
Perhaps the most consequential reforms of the Quiet Revolution were Lesage's changes to education in Quebec. By 1960, much of the baby boomer generation entered adolescence, which pushed the province's weak education system to its breaking point. Lesage's provincial government took control of the situation. The 1964 Parent Report recommended the creation of a secular public education system. The Catholic Church, which controlled the public education system, was powerless in stopping any change that came about because of the report. Lesage gave Quebecois youth access to a more diverse, modern, and comprehensive education, free from religious dogma. The new Ministry of Education aimed to produce a skilled workforce and instill Quebecois values in the province's youth through the new education system. This was aided by the creation of general and professional teaching colleges throughout Quebec, intending to be distinct from both secondary schooling and university education. As the Ministry of Education intended, it would churn out a new generation of workers. Lesage undertook an ambitious endeavor with nationalizing Quebec's economy, bringing privately owned electric companies under provincial control. Hydro-Quebec was officially established in 1944, seeing Maurice Duplessis leaving the establishment untouched, but it was during the Lesage government's tenure that it truly rose to prominence. Quebec is blessed with abundant natural resources, including vast rivers and waterways. Jean Lesage's government saw an opportunity to capitalize on this natural wealth by nationalizing it. A snap election in the fall of 1962 effectively gave the Lesage government the go-ahead to take control of the private companies. This economic nationalization was reflected in the party's new slogan of Maître Chez Nous, Masters in Our Own House. Nationalization meant that the French-speaking folks in Quebec could now work entirely in French and improve their technical, scientific, and managerial skills. This Francization also happened in education, social welfare, health services, and throughout various government departments. This effectively made French the language of Quebec's working sector. The new Masters in Our Own House philosophy gave Quebec the confidence to assert itself more and demand changes in federal policy. Quebec decided to opt out of some 30 joint programs that the other provinces were part of. Instead, they went for fiscal compensation to manage their own services, like pensions, health care, and taxes. This came at a cost for Lesage. To pay for its own welfare, Lesage's government raised taxes and borrowed heavily, increasing the provincial net debt by more than 300% between 1960 and 1966. Lesage's reforms were also disliked in the rural areas of the province, where his quiet revolution had not made much of an impact. These rural areas acted as the Union Nationale's power base. With the Quiet Revolution, many Quebecois started questioning their place within the larger Canadian Confederation and pondered the idea of sovereignty. They sought to assert their distinct cultural identity and preserve their French language, which they saw as integral to their heritage. In fact, the name Quebecois was adopted by French Canadians who shared these views during the Quiet Revolution. Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson's liberal government saw the growing nationalist issue in Quebec and looked to quell tensions by electing three prominent French Canadians to Parliament in the mid-60s, Jean Marchand, Gérard Pelletier, and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. By giving French Canadians more representation in the federal government, the Liberal Party hoped it would give a reason for neo-nationalist and separatist groups to calm down. By 1966, the Union Nationale had reformed its image under Daniel Johnson, attracting dissatisfied conservatives and nationalists, and won Quebec's election on June 5th. The Union Nationale won 56 seats against the Liberals' 50. However, the Liberals obtained 47% of the popular vote, whereas the Unionists obtained 41%. In the late 1960s, a new political party emerged in Quebec, the Parti Québécois, led by René Levesque. A former journalist and cabinet minister of Lesage's government, Levesque championed the cause of Quebec's independence from Canada. 
the Parti Québécois sought to harness the growing sentiment of nationalism and separatism in Quebec, aiming to establish the province as a sovereign state. The Parti Québécois quickly gained popularity, especially among those who felt the Quiet Revolution didn't go far enough in protecting Quebec's distinct culture and identity. With fiery rhetoric and a compelling vision of an independent Quebec, Levesque and his party managed to strike a chord with a substantial portion of the Québécois population. One group that advocated for an independent Quebec was the Front de Libération du Québec, or FLQ. This radical separatist organization, founded in 1963, aimed to achieve Quebec's independence from Canada and create a socialist state, challenging both the political establishment and the federal government. Inspired by the decolonization movement in Africa and Asia at the time, especially armed conflicts like the Algerian War, the FLQ shared a conviction that Quebec must liberate itself from Anglophone domination and capitalism through armed struggle. Their objective was to destroy the influence of English colonialism by attacking its symbols. They hoped that Quebecers would follow their example and overthrow their colonial oppressors. Thusly, they turned to radical and deadly means of resisting this supposed tyranny. The National Revenue Building, the RCMP headquarters, the Canadian National Railways, the Black Watch Armory, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Queen Victoria Monument, the Grenade Shoe Factory, the Paul Sauvé Arena, Dominion Textiles, Standard Structural Steel, Eaton's, Murray Hill, Chambly Transport, the Montreal City Hall, the Bank of Nova Scotia, the Quebec Ministry of Labour, the Canadian Army, the Montreal Stock Exchange, the Queen's Printer, the Chateau Frontenac, the Industrial Acceptance Corporation, Mayor Drapeau's Residence, Loyola College, McGill University, the Bank of Montreal, and many others were bombed. In seven years, six people were killed. In 1963, they carried out their first bombings by placing bombs in the mailboxes of Federal Armories and at Westmount, a wealthy Anglophone neighborhood of Montreal. Wilfred O'Neill, a nighttime security guard, was killed. Sergeant Major Walter Leja of the Canadian Armed Forces was seriously injured when he tried to neutralize a bomb. The FLQ claimed responsibility. The FLQ didn't stop there. In 1964, they embarked on a campaign to rob banks and armories to fund and weaponize their operations. Their activities were becoming increasingly dangerous and concerning. An attempted robbery at International Firearms, a Montreal gun store, resulted in the deaths of two innocent employees and the arrests and convictions of the five robbers. Between 1964 and 1970, the FLQ carried out more bombing attacks, only adding to the death count. In February 1969, a bombing at the Montreal Stock Exchange injured 27 people. In June 1970, an explosion at the National Defense Headquarters building in Ottawa killed communications supervisor Jean d'Arc Saint-Germain. By 1970, the situation reached a boiling point. On October 5th, the FLQ made a bold and brazen move, kidnapping British diplomat James Cross in Montreal. They announced a 24-hour ultimatum that included the release of 27 imprisoned FLQ members, the publication of their manifesto, $500,000, and safe passage to Cuba or Algeria in exchange for Cross's freedom. Canada had entered a crisis. The Quebec government rejected the ultimatum, but left the door open for negotiations. In the days that followed, police raids resulted in the arrest of 30 people. French newspapers published the Manifesto, a diatribe against established authority that was also read on Radio Canada. The FLQ extended the deadline to October 10th. On that day, shortly before the 6 p.m. deadline, Quebec Justice Minister Jerome Choquette announced that if Cross were released, the FLQ would be granted safe passage out of Canada, but none of their other demands would be met. 
Shortly after the deadline passed, two masked FLQ members kidnapped Quebec cabinet minister Pierre Laporte while he was playing with his nephew on his front lawn. With the intensification of the crisis, Pierre Trudeau, who had been elected as Canada's 15th prime minister in 1968, requested the Canadian Armed Forces to deploy soldiers in Ottawa to protect high-profile people and locations. When questioned about just how far he'd escalate the high military presence in the city, Trudeau said, Just watch me. As federal troops began to flood the streets of Montreal, Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act, a law that had not been used in peacetime in Canada since World War II. This gave the government sweeping powers to maintain order and security, including the ability to arrest and detain individuals without charge. Within 48 hours of Trudeau's invocation, more than 250 people were arrested. On October 17th at 10.50 p.m., Laporte's body was found in the trunk of an abandoned car. An autopsy later revealed that he had been strangled. The crisis was far from over, but the tide began to turn. On December 3rd, police finally negotiated the release of James Cross in exchange for the safe passage of the FLQ members to Cuba. Despite having lost 22 pounds, James Cross was in relatively good health. In May of 1979, the federal Liberal Party and Pierre Trudeau lost the federal election. The Parti Québécois formed a minority government with Joe Clark, a prime minister with no personal stakes in Quebec. On May 20th, 1980, Quebecers headed to the polls to answer a fundamental question. Should Quebec secede from Canada? It was a historic decision that would shape the province's future. René Levesque already ran into some resistance. Pierre Trudeau had been re-elected to the position of prime minister with the added benefit of a majority government after Joe Clark's government had failed. Trudeau wished to preserve Canada's unity. Those in favor of independence argued for Quebec's right to self-determination, emphasizing the preservation of their language, culture, and unique identity. On the other side of the spectrum, opponents of independence, often referred to as federalists, believed that Quebec's interests were best served within the framework of Canada, a diverse and unified nation. On that fateful day, Quebecers cast their ballots. The first results showed the yes side was behind in the polls, but soon the historic referendum was over. Quebecers voted 60% against sovereignty and 40% in favor of it. The outcome of the referendum meant Quebec would remain a part of Canada, but the desire for greater autonomy and recognition of its unique identity didn't fade away. Over the following years, discussions about Quebec's place within Canada continued, leading to the Meech Lake Accord in 1987 and the Charlottetown Accord in 1992. However, both attempts to address Quebec's distinct status within Canada faced challenges and ultimately failed to be ratified. The Meech Lake Accord was an attempt to amend the Canadian Constitution to recognize Quebec as a distinct society and gain its formal acceptance. The accord failed to be ratified by all provinces. The Charlottetown Accord was another attempt to amend the Canadian Constitution, this time with broader changes to accommodate Quebec's demands for recognition. The accord was rejected in a national referendum. The failure of these accords led to debates about Quebec being a distinct society, and this led the separatist Parti Québécois to be elected into power in 1994. Premier Jacques Parizeau promised a new referendum on Quebec separating from Canada, which was planned for 1995. The build-up to the referendum was tense and dramatic. Both sides campaigned passionately, and the entire country watched as the fate of Canada hung in the balance. On October 30th, 1995, the people of Quebec headed to the polls. And when the votes were tallied, the results were incredibly close. In the end, the no side prevailed with 50.6% of the vote, while the yes side received 49.4%. This narrow margin showcased just how deeply divided the province was on the issue of sovereignty. The immediate aftermath of the referendum was emotionally charged. 
Jacques Parizeau made a controversial remark blaming the loss on money and the ethnic vote, drawing criticism and exacerbating tensions between Quebec's French-speaking majority and its English-speaking and immigrant communities. It is true that we have been defeated, but basically by what? By money and by the ethnic vote. Basically, that's it. So, all it means is that in the next round, instead of us being 60 or 61 percent to vote in favor, we'll be 63 or 64 percent, and it'll go through. But at this point, my friends, in the coming months, you know, there are people who were so afraid that the temptation to seek revenge is going to be great. And never will it be so important to have in Quebec that government of the Parti Québécois to protect us until the next round. The referendum's outcome had far-reaching consequences. While Quebec remained a part of Canada, the Canadian government recognized the need to address the province's concerns more effectively. In 1996, the federal government passed the Clarity Act, which laid out the conditions under which the government would negotiate the secession of a province. This act sought to clarify the rules surrounding any future referendums on sovereignty. Quebec's separatist movement did not die with the 1995 referendum, and it continues to live on. As seen in both the 1980 and 1995 referendums, Quebecers voted against secession. But the margin in the latter was incredibly narrow. The debate ignited discussions about the province's right to self-determination and cultural preservation. So the question remains, should Quebec try again to secede from Canada? Quebec's distinct language and cultural identity is one of the major factors when it comes to Quebec's self-determination. French is not just a language in Quebec, it's a core element of the province's identity. Many Quebecois believe that independence is essential to preserve their language, culture, and heritage. On the other hand, some argue that the French language is already safeguarded within Canada, making secession unnecessary. A significant aspect to consider is the impact on Canada's national unity and diversity. Canada is a nation of diverse cultures and languages, and Quebec's secession could raise concerns about the stability and cohesiveness of the country. On the flip side, embracing diversity could mean respecting Quebec's right to self-determination. Indigenous communities, both within Quebec and across Canada, have a unique historical relationship with the land and their treaties with the Crown. The James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, signed in 1975, redefined and framed land management, as well as the relationship between the Quebecois state and the indigenous peoples of the region. During the 1995 referendum, the Cree peoples claimed that in the event of a win for the Yes camp, they would want to stay part of Canada. This would threaten the territorial integrity of a future independent Quebec. Economic concerns have undoubtedly played a pivotal role in determining Quebec's independence. Quebec enjoys numerous economic benefits as part of Canada, including access to a larger market, interprovincial trade, and shared resources. However, Secession could introduce economic uncertainties, such as establishing a new currency, trade agreements, and potential complications in international relations. Looking forward, what would a hypothetical Quebec secession mean for both Quebec and Canada? Quebec would face numerous challenges, from establishing its government to international recognition. At the same time, Canada would experience a significant loss, both culturally and economically. The potential ripple effects could shape North American geopolitics. The true answer to the question of whether Quebec should secede from Canada is ultimately a personal one, and the exact benefits and negatives of Quebecois secession can only be known in the event of actual self-determination. <laughs>